Skype. Welcome to Seymour's World. I'm Seymour Kazimersky. I hope you guys are having a wonderful day. I am. And I first have to tell you two things before we introduce our guest. Number one, do you see my beard? We talked about it last week, and I don't know if Zuri's going to focus in on it, but this beard is now 17 days old. Thank you, Zuri. I started it on November the 1st, and it's for Cancer Awareness Month for men, especially for prostate cancer and testicular cancer. So everybody who sees me says you're a bum, or you look like hell, or why, uh, why didn't you shave yesterday? The answer is because of Cancer Awareness Month. We have 185 people who have signed up uh, to grow their beards from Seymour's World, and on November the 30th, the end of the month, we are going to take pictures of everybody. And then November, on December the 1st, everybody's going to shave. And we are going to announce a winner of the best beard on the following show. So I hope you like my beard. I know Sue, my wife, and Alana, my daughter, have decided that I should not have a beard after December the 1st, or they're both moving out. So I guarantee you I will be shaving on December one. Next, I want to talk about last week's show. Uh, Skyler, that young lady, 13 years old, who has lupus and is requiring major medical treatment, had a fundraiser at the Pagoda Hotel. Sue and I were very privileged to go, and I can't tell you how much aloha we felt at that event. Uh, the most amazing part was this young lady who is suffering through all of her debilitating diseases has such an amazing perspective on life about how much she wants to make other kids aware of what her disease is all about, how much her cancer is important for people to realize they can avoid if they stay out of the sun. So we have to give Skylar a lot of kudos, and uh, I thank all of you who have sent me all your notes about this young woman, an amazing, amazing young lady. So let's get to today's show. I have a wonderful guest. I'd like to introduce Jay to you, Jay Henderson. Hi, Jay. It is such a pleasure to have you. I have only known you for a couple of months because we both work in China in one way or the other, but I felt the first time we met that we had an instant recognition that we knew each other for a long time. And I think China is something that we're both very passionate about, and I'm so glad that you're able to join us today because uh, people need to hear more about the real China. And I liked what you said when you told me that you, you, you lecture on China and you call it Peking past Peking. And I think it's a, it's a great idea. So let's start and talk a little bit about who you are and where you come from and give us a little bit of your background. Well, thanks, Seymour, for having me on your show. Uh, really nice to be here, be able to talk to your vast audience out there. Uh, I am originally from Kansas, and I went off into the Navy and went to Vietnam and uh, was involved in that uh, conflict there and came back and um, with a conviction that uh, a lot of that war had been started on the basis of a misunderstanding. So since then, I've been uh, working hard to, uh, in various capacities, to increase understanding between the United States and the countries of Asia, in particular China. And uh, you say you came to Hawaii from the war? Did you come directly from, from Vietnam to Hawaii? No, that was, I went first back to Washington and I worked on a presidential campaign to uh, George McGovern's to end the war. I was actually on his Senate staff. And then after he lost that election, I came out to the East West Center and got a master's degree in Chinese history and, at, the, at the University of Hawaii and um, then went back to New York for, oh, 10 years or so and worked for the group that hosted the ping pong team from China. Uh, I had, of course, learned Chinese uh, at, a, at an elementary level by that time. And after about 10 years in New York, I then uh, was asked to head the Inter Institute of International Education programs in Asia. And they sent me to Hong Kong and my job there was to open up China for IIE that runs the Fulbright program worldwide. At the time that I went there, they had 6,000 uh, students from the mainland of China in the United States. 
by the time I left, a few years later, 10 years later, they had 60,000. And I read in the paper this week that this year they have 287,000. So I was there at the very beginning trying to set up programs to help the Chinese come to the United States and learn what they needed to learn. But at the same time, I thought they would learn a lot about who, uh, who Americans are, how we think, why we do what we do, even though we sometimes do things that, can, that they can criticize, they will at least understand us. And, you know, if misunderstandings cause war, the, the contrary applies, which is if you can decrease misunderstanding, you can decrease the potential for war. So that's basically what I've done in my career. Well, you are obviously one of the experts on China from the areas that you have worked in. Uh, you and I both share, I think, a date. I first went into China in 1980, and I think you were similar to that date, right? I went in 1977 for the first time. Uh, I've been going every year since then, uh, some years many times, particularly the years I was living in Hong Kong. I was in Hong Kong for 15 years. So all in all, I've been to China more than 100 times. Um, and I've been really, without boasting, I've been to, play, to more places in China than most Chinese because they don't have this, uh, at least for many years, they do now, but uh, they didn't have the ability to travel around inside China. And my first 20 years of going there, I was taken around by Ministry of Education, Ministry of Sports, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, etc. So I really got to see a lot of China. I find that um, when I travel to China, and of course my travel is really business, uh, I find that working with the Chinese companies that uh, I've been fortunate enough to work with, they're extremely honorable, very, very hardworking, and uh, one of the most important parts of it, they really do invite you to be part of their family. And that was a very important part for me because I felt comfortable in doing business with them. Did you find that as well uh, in your travels to China? Oh, I've, I, I, when I'm not in China, I miss it. Really? Uh, it's, it's a very um, uh, full of gewittlichkeit, uh, as the Germans say. Aloha, as the Hawaiians say. It's mm -hmm. just, it, it has a lot of that in it. Of course, you have to be... You occasionally encounter people, and, and in my jobs, I had to negotiate and I had to have differences of opinion. We had to work them out, and sometimes they were on the other side of the table from me and we couldn't agree. But at the end of the day, we always um, had a nice banquet of one sort or another and worked things out. Yeah, I think China is, is, a, is, a, is a, a very friendly, welcoming place, particularly to Americans. i tell you one short story. About two years ago, I went way down in the south of uh, China, in a town called Tongcheng, right on the Burma border. And it turned out that uh, there was a park there that was commemorating the cooperation between the people of that area and the Americans who had fought side by side with the Chinese against the Japanese who were trying to come into that area from Burma. You know, the Burma Road and all this. This was the, this was the, the, the front, right, where the, they drew the line and said no more. Mm -hmm. And the Americans were there side by side with it. Well, in the graveyard, there was uh, 15,000 Chinese soldiers and about, about 200 American soldiers that are buried down at the bottom. And there really are uh, uh, respected. There are statues of uh, General Chenault and General uh, MacArthur in the garden. And as I was walking down the street, if people said, you're an American, they would say, welcome, thank you. It's no nice to have you here. I find the same thing in business. I was uh, in, uh, I think it was in Chengdu. This was in the mid-80s, and I'm a tennis player, and I wanted to get some exercise, and I asked, the, uh, I, I asked one of the people I was dealing with, does anybody play tennis? And he says, I have a friend who plays tennis. In, in, in 20 minutes, he had arranged a match for me at some tennis club that was an hour away, because that was the only tennis club at the, at the time, and he went out of his way, totally out of his way, to make sure that he did something for me. And that's the kind of reaction I receive when yeah. I get to China. So we're both on the same page, and I think our audience needs to understand we're not coming um, at this meeting today to discuss the total political ramifications of the student protests and all that stuff. We can talk about it, uh, you know, ad nauseum everybody else has. I want people to understand the different side of China. The, China's the, the China that you have been in, everybody uh, who has been to China, I'll bet you 95% of the people who have been to China just go to Beijing and Shanghai because that's where the Great Wall is and that's where Pudong is. But you've been to places I've never been to. And I'd like people to understand that it's a huge country with a, a huge diversity. 
and uh, in in our prologue and our PR piece of, about you, we talked about the Muslim section of China. So if you could give us a little bit of a picture of the country of China, how diversified is it? What is it really like? Great question, Seymour. Um, I have. I can describe the eastern part of China, the eastern one half of China, starting from the seaboard and going in, let's say a thousand miles, is where the Han Chinese live. And they make up about 90% of the population of China. And they're what you know, and that's what everybody knows as being Chinese. Further beyond that, at least down in the south and southwest, you get into the Tibetan areas. And in the north and northwest, you have north, you have Mongolian, and in the northwest, you have uh, Muslim areas. You have the, the Uyghurs and the Hui, which are both Muslim. Um, it's a huge area, and I have, during my first 30 years of going to China, I did go to a lot of places, but mostly even then, I went to big cities like Nanjing and Hangzhou and etc. that a lot of Americans couldn't go to. But I, I was always itching to get out to the uh, remote areas and see what's happening out there. And you're talking about, let's try to understand China. One of the questions that I asked myself a few years ago was, what is happening with regard to the level of development inside China, deep inside China, the areas where foreigners very rarely go. They go, but not certainly not officials and not people from the embassy. It just takes too much time and too much effort to go. I was trying to see what's happening out there because the, the, one of the, uh, the um, stories that we get back in the United States is that the Han Chinese, who are on the eastern areas, who have already gone up the ladder, economic ladder. Well, here's a picture of my, one of my, uh, the route of one of my trips. Uh, you can see there where I went. Uh, through Mongolian areas and down through Muslim areas and down through Tibetan areas and finally out. It took me two months to do this trip and I went by public bus. <laughs> uh, I would go down the road and see something that I liked and I would tell the driver to stop and let me off and he would he would let me off. And I would, a couple of days later, I'd go back up to the road and hail the next bus coming down and, and go a little bit further down the road. I was in no rush. I just wanted to see it. So the rap that the Chinese have gotten is that they're ripping off, the Han Chinese are ripping off the minorities, that they've gotten, they've gone up the ladder, the economic ladder, gone from eating the leaves off the trees and the grass off the ground for a hundred years. They've gone from that to, well, I call it from rickshaw to rolls, you know, in one generation, but that's all confined on the East Coast. So I wanted to see what was happening in the remote areas. So I spent three straight years, each year, each trip, going out to these remote areas like that map that you just saw, taking long trips, trying to uh, put my finger on uh, what's happening. And I came back with um, uh, a conclusion that uh, the minorities out there are uh, not suffering the way that uh, we in the West are being told that they are, that um, they are on an economic ladder that is up. It may be about 20 years behind their Han brothers and Han relatives on the east in the eastern areas, but they're on an upward ladder. It's going up. I can tell you one story. I went into a town called Lang Busu, which is um, a horse town. Uh, they had some um, manhole covers that were, were all missing on the, uh, this in the middle of the street because the horses could walk around them. It was dangerous for a car to go down the street. But anyway, it was way up in the mountains. It was a Tibetan area, Tibetan and Muslim area, by the way. Uh, and I walked into a store, and I looked at a uh, cashmere sweater. Of course, cashmere comes from there. You know, these are where they, they grow these, these sheep. It was $100. Okay, in China, you never buy what the, at the ticket price. You always bargain. But even so, $100 way out there in, the, in that remote area sort of shocked me. And then I started looking at the state of the infrastructure, at the hospitals, at the roads, at the schools, at the um, housing. And... Uh, it was completely different than I had imagined, much more developed and much more on the upward path than uh, we in the West have been led to believe by the reporting. That is based on, I mean, it has to be fairly superficial because to really understand China, you've got to go there and get subcutaneous. 
but the reporting we're getting is, is basically uh, uh, quite confined to uh, telling the world, telling Americans that the Chinese are not doing very well and that the minorities are suffering. I think in Tibet, the minorities, the Tibetan minority, uh, the Chinese could do better in handling that situation, but that'd be a subject for another one of your shows. Uh, the Muslim areas, I didn't get deep into the Muslim areas. I went right up to the edge where the Han Chinese went from being 51% or more to being 49%. And at that point, the, the Muslims was the area that I went to first and then to the Tibetan areas. They become the majority. And it was really interesting to see the way that that played out, the relationships between the minorities and the majority Han. Huh? I think we want to expound on that a little bit more, Jay, because I'm fascinated with uh, the idea of our journalistic viewpoint of, because that's all we have, our journalists who show us those pictures of China and what is really happening out there. So if we could come back after a break and, and discuss that a little bit, because I feel there is definitely, from what I have seen in uh, what I have done in China, very different from what a lot of what we see on TV today. Can we get back to sure, that? Sure, great. We are going to take a short break. I'm Seymour Kazimersky on Think Tech Hawaii. We'll be back in a minute. Okay, I'm Jay Fidel. That's Ray Starling. We co-host a show called Hawaii, the State of Clean Energy, every Wednesday, 4 to 5 p.m. It's really interesting. You know, Ray has a way of unzipping these guys. He asks them these questions, and all this stuff tumbles out, and we find out stuff we would never know about without Ray's questions. Thank you, Ray. You're welcome, uh, Jay. I, I'm very pleased to be your um, Ed McMahon uh, <laughs> every Wednesday at 4 o'clock here uh, on, uh, on the Internet. So you can join us and see what's happening in the energy world, and there is a lot going on. So join us uh, every Wednesday at 4 o'clock. Yeah, come around. Be energized right here on ThinkTech. Aloha. Welcome back to Seymour's World. I'm Seymour Kazimersky at ThinkTech Hawaii. Uh, we have a wonderful guest today, Jay Henderson, who has traveled in China for the last 40 years, much more than me, and has seen a lot more than I have seen because I've done business in there. Well, Jay has really got into areas of China that I think 99.9% uh, .9 of Americans who have said they have been to China have never visited before. So it's very interesting to understand that China is not made up of just the eastern side, as you said, Jay, of the Beijings and the Shanghais and the Shenzhens. It's made up of a lot more. And the people that live out there do have influence on what is going to happen in China. So let's talk a little bit about some of the areas, Jay, that you, for instance, you mentioned a Muslim population. A lot of people, I would say most of our listeners and our audience, had no idea that there are Muslims in, the, Muslims in China. Tell us, uh, tell, tell us a little bit about them. Uh, I'm not an expert on the world population of Muslims, but I've heard that uh, China is the second or third, has the second or third largest Muslim population of any country in the world. Of wow. course, the largest being Indonesia, which has some 150 million uh, Muslims living there. China has second or third. All of this is much, much more than they have in the entire Middle East. Wow. You know? And are they, are they segregated from the, from the rest of the population? Are they allowed to pray, for instance? Are they, do they have to uh, uh, live by rules of China, or are they allowed religious freedoms? That's what I'm trying to get at from the freedom side. Yeah, good question. The uh, religious freedom uh, is getting much uh, greater in China. Uh, as I travel around those Muslim areas, I went to one town, uh, just south of Lanzhou, where they call it the Mecca of China or the Mecca of the East. They had 40 some odd um, mosques in that city. And as I was driving down the road, I could see the, the minarets really? sticking up all over. And I stopped at the town and I spent a few days there and, and went into some of, the, uh, some of the mosques. People were praying three times a day and were not being impeded at all. Um, you know, what happens in China is if you use your religion to push some kind of a political agenda, you start to get into trouble. You want to use it to, to uh, answer to a different drummer like the Dalai Lama. That's the reason that the Chinese have such a problem with him. Um, rather than, or like the Pope, rather than following what Beijing mm -hmm. wants you to say. 
uh, then you get into trouble. But otherwise, uh, religion is 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 much better, and religious freedom is much better in China today than it was 20 years ago. Christianity, uh, Buddhism, Judaism, Taoism, is Judaism, yeah, Kaifeng is the is the uh, uh, Israel of, of China. There's a lot of Jews and a lot of uh, uh, temples in 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 Kaifeng. I've been there as well and seen that up close. So you just don't want to toy with the political issues and get into independence or um, human rights or these other things which the Chinese want to control because they think that it's necessary for their stability. And now, of course, you're getting into something that we weren't going to discuss yeah, I won't. today because we did want to talk about the politics. We've, we've done that before, and actually we're going to do another show on it. And I'll invite you to come on if you would like. But um, uh, I find the people in China, and this is a strange thing for most of you to hear, are amongst the happiest people in the world. They love to go out to eat. They love to play. They love their chatter around their street stalls that they have, for instance, in the evening. It's absolutely amazing. They're very, very happy people. And it's not because of ignorance of, of what else is out there. It's because they're happy people with what they have, which means they don't have the westernized philosophy of, I want more all the time. Rather, I'm happy with what I have, which is good health, a good family, and so on and so forth. Not perfect, but it's the way it is. And it's not something that we should look at as a, uh, as a society and say, ours is better than yours, therefore you have to change. you agree with me? Oh, yes. I, I love the joy that I, came, that I kept encountering in remote areas of China. For example, um, after work and after dinner, people just pour out of their Correct. houses and they go to the parks and they dance. And somebody, maybe the authorities or somebody, sets up a loudspeaker and they play music and people, it's like wine dancing in the United yes, States exactly, in, yes. in, in some kind of establishment, but this is out in the park, and you're talking about thousands of people and groups, one group over here learning how to waltz, and one group over here learning how to do something else, and they dance. All the plazas and all of the, uh, the parks are full of people doing various things. That's one, one, uh, one piece of the puzzle, I think, that makes China what it is today, that the people in China uh, enjoy their lifestyle the way it is. They sure, uh, certainly, they are extremely hard workers. We all know that. Mm. But more important is that if they're happy with what they have, and uh, obviously the Chinese government uh, doesn't allow them as much as we would allow ourselves in a democracy, but at the same time, why fool with something if it's good? Well, they have desires and aspirations. They do want to have a larger television or a better refrigerator or stuff like that or a car or whatever. Uh, and and they, they strive for that. But at the same time, they never let, never let it get to them if they don't have that because they are the family unit is very tight and uh, they support each other and they're uh, basically a very happy, happy people even if they're their desires are uh, not fully realized. I find that the village concept is very strong in China. So when I visited an area that was in the farming, farming community, uh, the village worked together. It was not as if everybody had their own separate plot of mm. land to mm. farm. Mm. Everybody would help each other if mm. something was wrong or something happened. Yeah, Americans, I like that. Americans really are quite interested sometimes when they go to China and see the way that the village works. I'm from Kansas, and my relatives are all farmers, and my cousin Clayton lives over here, and he's got a 1,000 acres, and cousin Wilbur, he lives over there, and he's got 2,000 acres. And there's a town where you go into, and there's a restaurant and maybe a couple of grain silos and, and a general store. But in China, all of that is together. Everybody lives together, and you get up in the day, and you go out to your field right. and take care of it. You right. have a plot of land that could be 5 or 10 miles away. It's and amazing. There and, and then you, you harvest it, and you bring it into the market, and you, and you sell it. Uh, it. From the very beginning, you know, the Chinese long ago were much more communally organized than we were in the United States. The closest thing we have in the United States is the co-op system. where Correct. Correct. A, a common ownership of, of combines, air-conditioned combines and harvesters and stuff like that are frequently owned by the, the co-op because individual farmers can't own them. They're very 
Very yeah. interesting concept. Well, Jay, I'd like to s show some pictures, if you don't mind. Yeah. And we have so many, but we're just going to limit it to a few. Maybe we'll do another show. So if we could ask Zuri to bring up the first one. Now, this is a map. So let's talk a little bit about, uh, you started off in the east, right? Started in Beijing, right on, over there on the, on the right, and then I went into Inner Mongolia's capital. And then I, I went down across two of the poorest provinces in China, Gansu and uh, Ningxia, and uh, wound up going into Sichuan and then out into uh, Yunnan at the end. And, and I, this was by private bus or by bus? Public bus. By public bus, and you did this all by yourself for a couple of months. Well, I had another guy with me, but he didn't speak Chinese. That's one of the reasons I went along was sort of to <laughs> help him out. But we had a good time. Um, he was just a gregarious fellow who likes to travel. Um, and I, as I say, I told you my motivation. I wanted to see what was happening out in those well, areas. Well, let's see some of your pictures. Here, let's get the first one up. Some of them are quite going to be quite surprising. Look, here you see a, a park, and you see a ping pong, a row of ping pong tables, and you see some people out doing things during the day. Every there were lots of parks in every city, and they were always full of people doing interesting things. And I want you to notice how clean it is too. And notice those two. Uh, buildings in the background, uh, two tall buildings. This is a city called Lanzhou, which, you know, 20 years ago was rubble. It just was not at all. And this is deep inside China, a thousand miles. It's it's sort of like the St. Louis, though, of China. That is to say, it's the end of where the Han are in the majority. Beyond that, you go into uh, Muslim areas. Actually, 50 miles away, you're in a Muslim area. And uh, all of these ping pong tables and athletic facilities are free to everybody, obviously. It's not as if you have to belong to a club to, to, to participate. The government provides all well, that. Well, th these are, yes. You might have some golf clubs around that are yeah. private yeah. and stuff like that, but yeah. Let's see, let's see the next one. This is the inside of a store, <laughs> and it, it sell, it's a pharmacy. And I think, I can't quite remember, yeah, I, think right. I think it's a pharmacy. They're selling Western medicine, they're selling Chinese medicine. Uh, but just look how clean and well lit it is. You find this all over China, no matter how remote the place is. And then the next one. This is uh, all. The, it's also uh, the street of Lanzhou. I think you can see uh, a Muslim person down there in the lower left with a white uh, headdress on. And they're very tolerated. It's not an issue. People very tolerated. Look, yeah. You know, people I, don't look down on them the way. Uh, we do in the Western world because of the issues we have. Oh, uh, no, no, not at all. They're actually more in charge out there. They, they pray openly, as I say, three times a day. They flock down. Even the, they'll just drop what they're doing at the office and go over to the mosque and pray, and they go back. That's why they have so many mosques. Oh, interesting. We should have a couple more, I think, that we can show. Oh, that's beautiful. Oh, I just love this. This is on the uh, Yellow River, um, and it's a one-kilometer-long dragon. And it's just the, the festivity, festive aspect of life in China, how they can sometimes do totally crazy but totally fun things like this. Um, it's, a, um, it's propped up on the back by bamboo sticks. Right. <laughs> and it's a one kilometer long, and the people just love looking at it. Oh, wow. Let's see another one if we can. Uh, this is just a, a market. It's a day yeah. market that turns into a night market, and uh, people come there and eat. But just look how immaculate it is. I was so surprised because I'm used to going to places in China that where they have problems with trash and sanitation and stuff. But this is a, this is in a very very um, uh, uh, small city called Maracan in in uh, Sichuan province. And again, the cleanliness of the street, considering it's a market where food is all out and and people are all going through it. You could tell it's a very, very clean area. Right. Very, very clean. I think, you know, what's so fascinating to me is that uh, when I would visit areas in uh, China that were not part of the industrialized areas that I, w that, that I was used to going in, I felt very safe. I, d I wasn't worried about pickpockets, or I wasn't worried, you know how in some areas you have to be very, very careful. Even in the Western world, in, in, in certain areas in Greece and Italy and all that kind of stuff, the first thing they warn you when you get off is beware of pickpockets. I felt very safe. Did you, when you were doing this journey all the way through? I always felt safe. Um, I did have a belly belt where I kept my passport, just in case. 
but I've never once been pickpocketed or mugged or uh, approached. Um, never once. I, you know, things like that happen very, very rarely in China, I suppose particularly to a foreigner because the police would be very uh, aggressive in trying to track down whoever did it. I was stopped twice by police um, as I was going into remote and sort of sensitive areas. I went through one area in, in Sichuan, which is nearby a um, uh, Tibetan uh, monastery where young Tibetan monks were setting themselves on fire. And they really didn't want a lot of foreigners going in there and taking a look. But if you did, they wanted to know who you were and where you were going and how long you were going to stay. Those are the questions that they asked me. Uh, I, as I say, that happened twice. They asked me to step off the bus, and, and, but they were polite. And then in one case, I said, why are you taking this information? Do you want to keep me from going in there? No, you're welcome to go in, but it's a bit sensitive, and if something happens in there, uh, we want to know how many foreigners are in there so we can go in and help them get out. Interesting, very interesting. I, I didn't have that w with me, but I wasn't going into those sensitive areas. The, the most sensitive area was just last month when I was in, uh, in Hong Kong uh, on business, and I went to the protest area, and there were a lot of police and a lot of uh, barriers that we couldn't cross over, you know, to do that kind of stuff. I did not find that once while, while I'm traveling inside China, per se. I found the uh, egress and, 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 and just getting in and out of things very, very simple. I lived in Hong Kong 15 years, and I still remember one time when uh, my daughter, who was 10 years old at the time, wanted to take the public bus across town to see a friend, and we let her do it. Hmm? It's that safe. Right. Doesn't mean that it isn't unsafe, but the degree of peril is very, very low compared to, I mean, when I came back to the United States, that's one of the things that, that's one of the things that was the hardest for me to adjust to, was the level of violence and the level of crime. It's so much higher in our country than it is in China. We are getting a fascinating look at China through the eyes of Jay Henderson, uh, just being able to understand the, the real China, I called it in my PR piece, or peeking past Peking, as you as you put it, Jay. I think it's uh, it's it's wonderful to really understand the other side of a country. We have to take a short break, and then we will be back. I'm Seymour Kazimersky on Seymour's World at Think Tech Hawaii. Back. This is Alice Lee Hagen, host of Think Tech Hawaii Business Education Spotlight. My show here at Think Tech Hawaii is every Thursday from three to four in the afternoon. I bring in interesting guests from Hawaii, the mainland, and hopefully international guests in the future. Do join us on Thursday from 3 to 4 p.m. ThinkTech Hawaii Business Education Spotlight. Aloha. Aloha. My name is Josh Green. I host a show called Healthcare in Hawaii here on ThinkTech. We get together once a week or sometimes uh, twice a month. Depends. When we're busy, we get together less often, but we love to see you here to talk about the preeminent health care issues in our state. Our programs vary very widely. We talk about economics, we talk about health care, we talk about social issues on this program. Thanks for joining us. Hi, welcome back to Seymour's World. I'm Seymour Kazimersky. My guest today is Jay Henderson, a China traveler, somebody I thought I had traveled China a lot not close to this guy. Jay is uh, absolutely amazing with all of the stories he has. We could do probably five or ten shows just talking about inner China, not just the big cities, but inner China the way it is. Jay, you have another life, obviously, besides what you've done in China. You have a consulting company, I know. We have a friend uh, the, who does business in China together, which is great. I, I, I'd like to know about some of the experiences that you've had, even some of the funny ones or some of the great ones that you've had, or even some of the terrible experiences. So why don't you just start at the top and give us one of your best experiences? Well, uh, I have... Um Someday I should write down some of these experiences, but you've given me an opportunity to talk about at least Go one or two. Absolutely. Uh, I just had a wonderful time when I was living in New York, working for the group that hosted the ping pong team from China to the United States in 1972. It was called the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, and this was in the early days of U.S.-China relations. 
And there were only three of us working in this as professionals in this uh, office in New York City. And we were helping uh, to escort around the United States Chinese delegations that were invited by uh, various Americans, including the State Department, but also including private interests in the cultural and political areas. And I was uh, assigned a couple of um, portfolios. Mine was sports and education. And uh, I can tell you one, one for example, I uh, uh, put on, we invited uh, the uh, Chinese men's soccer team to come to the United States. And I took them on a nationwide tour. We put on soccer games against American professional soccer games. And one was at the uh, Meadowlands in New Jersey. Out, just outside of New York City in yeah. New Jersey. And Secretary of State Cyrus Vance came up for that game. We had 30,000 people. We played the Cosmos. And the Cosmos were, at that time, were uh, owned by uh, a gentleman named Ahmed Ertigan, who had made his fortune by discovering Ray Charles and helping Ray Charles get off the ground. He also owned the World Trade Center towers, both of them. Uh, anyway, he had enough money that he brought to the team Pele, probably the most oh famous soccer player ever, um, a man named Franz Beckenbauer, who was famous in Germany and who went on to become president of the Federation of International Football, the soccer group, and a man named Giorgio Cinaglia, who was an Italian, the three of them. Anyway, the Chinese played, and uh, the score was, I don't know, one to nothing or something like that. A very, very close, hardly fought, hard fought game. And that night we went down to uh, downtown Manhattan. We rented an entire big restaurant, and, uh, a Chinese restaurant, and we just had a great big party. I remember Pele walking into the party, uh, having a whole bunch of bling around his neck, and a uh, girl on HR. <laughs> it was really <laughs> wonderful. Really <laughs> wonderful. I had many, 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 many stories like that to tell. Well, I should say one more thing. Yeah. Very quick. I knew Yao Ming's parents before they were married. Oh my God. Because were they was, tall as well? They were really tall. Yeah. One was on the on the Chinese women's men's basketball team. The other was on the Chinese men's uh, national basketball well, team. Since you gave one story, I'll give one story, okay. too. And my story involves my daughter, Alana. We were in China a, a few years ago, and she wanted to come along with me. And as you know, when you go uh, to see a potential business partner, they take you out for a fabulous dinner, and they have a private room for you, and they have uh, a great food, and everybody drinks a lot. They're called kampais, where you're toasting everybody. And uh, uh, Victor, who was our host, a Chinese uh, businessman, he had uh, he put uh, Alan on his left side and me on his right side, and this fabulous Chinese meal was served. And then he uh, uh, just leaned over to Alan and he says, "Alana, may I offer you something very special?" And I had already warned Alana that some of the food may not be to her liking, and just. Enjoy it for what it is. Take a bite or two. That's enough, you know. But just just don't embarrass me and basically turn colors or throw up or something like that. So she said, yes, of course. And out comes, he orders it in Chinese, and out comes this plate and a silver platter, and they take off the dome of the silver platter. And there were two chicken feet mm. there mm. with the nails and mm. everything on it. Mm. Uh, not what you would call a delicacy, to say the least. And my daughter, and I'm so proud of her for doing that, she, they, they cut it up for her, and, and she ate it. And then I was hoping she wouldn't say she has to run to the bathroom or something, ate the whole thing. And Victor leans over to her, and he says, Miss Alana, did you enjoy that? And she looked at him straight in the face, and she said, That was very good. If I was hungry, I might have another one. And I was just very proud of her. Very diplomatic. Her. Yes, very diplomatic. She learned from her daddy, obviously, and did a fabulous, fabulous job. Jay, in, um, in retrospect, you know, we're talking about China uh, and your travels. Uh, do you see China changing in the future? Do you see it continuing, uh, growing the way it is? Well, this is a subject of another hour long. Uh, we only have a couple of minutes. I so. will try to be brief. I just finished a 10-day jaunt around the Gulf of Bohai, which is in the northeast of China. And the reason that I went up there, instead of back into the interior, where I've been for the last three or four years, I wanted to just see what was happening in the heavily industrialized areas. And uh, 
I saw that what I had expected, which is the infrastructure is pretty much intact. They have good subway systems, good electrical systems, um, everything else, hospitals, etc. What I didn't expect to see was the tremendous amount of buildings of new apartments. Uh, the Chinese are expecting, right now they have, out of 1.3 billion, they may have between 300 and 400 million urban residents. The rest live in the countryside. They're expecting that to go up to by maybe hundreds of millions in the next 20 years. Well, that's why they built these. That's why they're building these things. And the second point I will make is that you and I, in our short association with China, have seen a transformation of China from what it was, which was, as I say, pretty, pretty hard up, to what it is. And people are awed by the process, progress that they have made. What I think I, I would like to say in response to your question is, they're just getting started. If you think that the progress that they've made so far is awesome, the progress that I think I can, that I saw on this, this last trip that I took, if I can see 20 years into the future, it's even, it's going to be, you have right now three or 400 million that have, people that have been lifted out of poverty. What happens if you have 600 or 700 million citizens in China who are empowered with information, albeit slightly censored, in delicate areas. They're empowered with information. They're empowered with money. They can travel. Whoa! We have got to get ready for it. And there are two ways that we can handle this. Of course, there's four. Part of it depends on how the Chinese behave, positively or negatively. We can depend. We can behave positively or negatively. Uh, but we, whatever it is that we do, we have to, be, we have to get ready for it. I'm, I'm very encouraged by some of the things I see happening in Hawaii, uh, and the head of the uh, appointment of the, of the Hawaii Tourism uh, Director to be the new governor's chief of staff is very encouraging because that man understands he can see in the future, he can see that the Chinese are coming this way and it, that Hawaii has to be well positioned to be able to better manage and better, better take care of this. If we don't want to blow it. We don't want to miss any opportunity. We want to maximize every opportunity for them as well as for us. I think the, the one caveat, because I happen to agree with you on this point, the one caveat is we need to educate America and the Western world what China is all about. Instead of looking at them as a big bully, which a lot of people do, we have to look at them as a potential partner in, in making this world a better and a safer place. It's so funny, just before we started, we were talking about terrorism and what's going on in the world, and somebody said, I think it was Jay Fidel, he said, you know, Seymour, China might become the safest place in the world to mm -hmm. be. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. And it's a, a very interesting comment. And we have to look at China as more, as, more of, as a partner rather than saying they're stealing our jobs and they're doing all that kind of stuff. If we look at them as a country of many, many different people and potentially a, a, a wonderful consumer of American goods as well as a wonderful producer of goods for the world, we might have a better place to live in. I think I'm hoping that. Absolutely true. Um, we we cannot get China wrong, and part of the problem that we were talking about a few minutes ago about uh, our how we view China and how our media portray China to us is it's very important that we don't misunderstand them. And I as a, I'm not a China expert, I would say I'm a China specialist, but I think that if I can say. Um, uh, one thing about my uh, my life is that I may say nice things about China. I may talk about them in a positive frame, and I may try to tell my American friends, don't look upon them as being such a menace. Because I see that as stoking the fires uh, of, of, a, of an adversarial and a, and a confrontational relationship, which would be unhealthy for them and very unhealthy for us. I think you're 100% right. And unfortunately, we have to end this. But we're going to continue it, uh, Jay, at another time. Because uh, I think people are listening to us, and they're starting to realize, wait a second, maybe there's more to China than what we're seeing on CNN. I'm pro-American, not pro-China. Me too, me too. Uh, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. It has been—it goes so quickly because when you're talking about a subject that opens eyes 
for people and makes them understand that the world is much, much more complex than we make it to be, and we try to simplify it in sound bites rather than understanding. So uh, again, thank you so much for being with thank us. Thank you, Seymour. I thank you all for joining me today. It has been a uh, wonderful hour, as usual. Uh, next week, we are going to have, have Jack Scaff, Dr. Jack Scaff, uh, started the Honolulu Marathon here in Hawaii, and because the marathon is coming up in a, in a few weeks, he will be our guest. Uh, aloha from Hawaii. I'm Seymour Kazimersky, Seymour's World on ThinkTech Hawaii.